das ist. Right. I've just eaten and uh, looking at a while well, I was looking at uh, an article. I don't I don't read academic articles very often. I was actually just looking for images for a video for a short story. <laughs> But, you know, uh, it's about consciousness and I keep on coming across things that I just can't believe. So, a consideration of Humphrey's cerebral sentient loop explanation of consciousness from A History of the Mind by Nicholas Humphrey. It's by Max Bennett. Volume 1, 2, 3, parts 3 to 4, issued December 1993. 1993. Okay. So this guy called Nicholas Humphrey, uh, until recently the director of the unit of animal behaviour at Cambridge University, written a book called A History of the Mind. Okay, I'll, I'll read this, alright, but I think I'm going to make a video of this, because why? There must be easier ways to find out this information than tripping upon it you know, six, uh, 13 years out of date. <laughs> right. Humphrey argues that in the most primitive animals, such as jellyfish, the nerve nets convey information from the body wall concerning sensory phenomena, such as touch, towards the ganglia, which then issue an outgoing signal for the muscles of the body wall to respond, for example, with a contraction, giving a, a wriggle. Okay, that's quite reasonable. So you get sensory input, and then you kind of like contract your muscles and you move away. Fantastic. Humphrey goes on to suggest that with further evolution of the nervous system, the outgoing signal to the muscles of the body wall in response to an incoming sensory signal, okay, become modified so as to actually alter the incoming signal as well as to contract the muscles. This collateral effect of the outgoing motor nerves altering the signal arriving along the sensory nerves may even be present in the early evolved nervous systems of flatworms. Sorry. Okay, so indeed, an even further degree of collateralization can occur in which the motor collateral can give rise to sensory experiences independent of any incoming sensory signals. <laughs> what does that mean? Another form of collateralization involves the outgoing motor signal in response to a sensory input modifying the incoming sensory signal without actually contracting muscles at all. These collaterals can be used to sustain the sensory experience well after the actual event that gave rise to the initial sensation has passed. This ability to maintain a sensation, okay, so what it means is like I touch something hot, okay? So you touch something hot, okay? As you touch it, sends a signal to your brain, fantastic, you respond by contracting the muscles. But that message going out to the muscles to contract influences the signal that's going in, okay? Even to the extent where you take away the, uh, the stimulus and I will still respond and there's a kind of internal loop. I think the, the way I think about this is something to do with like vision, so you get, uh, you close your eyes, you can still see the image because there is enough cycle of the image going around in this kind of forward, we forward, forward feedback. They call it uh, collateral, collateral effect, collateral effect, right. This ability to maintain a sensation at will by using the collateralization effect is called sustaining the sentient the final evolution of this process, according to Humphrey, probably only occurs in the higher mammals. It involves the motor output that has been modified to only change in incoming signal, sig sensory signal, now degrading, degrading perhaps, I think it's degrading, degrading, G-E-D-R-A-T-I-N-G, now, no, I think it's a spell mistake and sustaining sensory signals itself within the brain in the absence of any sensory input. The nervous system is in this way able to voluntarily generate sensations and maintain them at will. It is this ability to use the sentient loop that is the highest form of consciousness. You've got to find this article and the guy's going to consider it. 
<laughs> anyway, why do, why do I, I get super excited. I almost get nervous. I almost get nervous when I experience these things. I, I kind of get stressed. Whereas before, I used to kind of like just lap this stuff up. Now I get kind of stressed. Why? I have to meditate there. I don't have to. It's unlike to meditate. Because I think there's aspects of what we're playing around with here, which is to do with consciousness. And unless you actually have a, a, a good, balanced consciousness, such thoughts can sort of like run away. You know, in the same way that throughout the history of science they've had lots of oddballs explaining how things work. And, uh, you know, it's one at ten or one out of a hundred that actually kind of like hit on the truth. Similarly, the qualities and degrees of mistakes that might occur regarding the examination of consciousness <laughs> must be, I mean, you know, the ratio must be a lot higher. One in a thousand, one in a million actually get like an accurate appreciation of the uh, consciousness. So therefore, for me, I'd like to go, right, okay, wait, calm down, all right? Because it's so exciting. The thoughts are so <laughs> exciting. They tie into my ideas about um, feedback loops in time, feed-forward loops and what we do with consciousness, how we make the world around us, and we do it in like microseconds. And I've been kind of like, I don't know, like playing around with that, but uh, certainly um, um, aware of it. And yeah, I've been playing around with it <laughs> for the last couple of years. I've been doing things like jacksing, and I record, not experiments, but it's just like, it's just like, I keep on mentioning, like cross Mac with what he's doing by recording what it is that you think and then listening to that. It's very interesting. Um, anyway, so regarding this collateral effect, most people are caught in themselves. Most people are projecting out upon the world what it is that they want to see. And they get to a certain age where that becomes behavioural. And then it cuts back into them and they have this feedback loop. And they effectively live in their own world. Which means that they don't actually engage what actually happens in front of them. This is quite familiar to all of us. Like we get up in the morning and we recognise our bedroom. And then we you know, go to the bathroom, we recognise the bathroom. You know, and we make this, and it's part of our programme, to the extent that you could alter the bedroom and you wouldn't notice. You bump into something, you go, what, what? And you think it's like, uh, it's your fault or something or other. But actually, it's because something has changed and you just don't see it. That's why, because you're kind of contained in this kind of loop. And the whole point about meditation in Buddhism is to stop it, stop the loop, so that you see what is actually going on in front of you. So as much as possible, you're getting the information, the input signal, and you, you just, uh, you're perceiving that directly. And there is no collateral uh, effect. At least that's what I can, can understand. So the idea is to appreciate a flower, not because you think it's beautiful, not because you know what species it is, not because you think it's red or anything like that. Before you put any words to it, definitely before you put any words to it, so you can see, well, actually, you don't even see it. You see it's part of everything. Um, and this is just words, but to actually do this with your own mind, that's what Buddhists are doing scientifically, I suppose, with their experiments. So, uh, so when I read these things, it's all very interesting, but it's uninformed by subjective experience. And I feel that that's the best way of approaching these things, is by reading some things that are very interesting and then checking out what that means internally and constantly making a, um, an integrated uh, approach. So, I'm going to meditate.